Now in our sixth year, this is GabNet, the great American broadcast network. Talk like you've never heard it before. says Alex. That's me. See the ramble? That's what this show is. And we're here until midnight tonight on the east coast of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Steve and Pearl. Hello, Steve. How, How, How are you? How are you? How are you? Do the mouse here. Yeah. He, hey, you can do it in your house here. Hey, what's up? Nobody remembers that, actually, but that was Soupy Sales. That was a big hit, 1965. Yeah. He that off And my friend, uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen Gruber, Steve Gruber, who is now uh, gone, uh, who was my best friend at the time, and he went, And uh, but before well, he went, he, jo- he was a member of the Friars Club. Uh, and and person who got him in, his sponsor was Soupy Sales. Oh, I love Soupy Sales. I used to watch them religiously as a kid. And in the summer of 1965, they sent me away to sleepaway camp, Camp Calumet in Ware, Massachusetts. And I was having nervous breakdowns because I was missing Soupy Sales every day. I went nuts. Uh, explain <laughs> explain Soupy Sales to the people, because let's face it. You remember Soupy Sales. I remember Soupy Sales. Right. You remember him more than I do because you're from New York, and he was yeah. a New York act. But oh, I yeah, remember sure. he then went kind of national, so we saw him elsewhere. Yeah. But explain Soupy, uh, this is going to be difficult. Explain Soupy <laughs> Sales. Soupy Sales had a, a kid's show, but adults could also join. it. I remember my father used to love it. And uh, he had puppets and like offbeat sketches and little things and some adult jokes hidden in. Mm-hmm. And uh, did he sh- I think he might have shown one cartoon. And he had he sang, he sang a song called The Mouse. Hey, do the mouse, yeah. Hey, you can do it in your house, yeah. He did it on the Ed Sullivan Show. Right. And another song, Papa Lapa Car, they whispered all over Turkey. It was a big hits back then. And he was just a crazy person. He wore a big old bow tie and he had puppets, the uh, white fang and black tooth, his two dogs. And yeah. he just saw the claw. <laughs> Yeah, they were great. Yeah. And it was just a funny scene. You know, I still watch clips now, and I, I said, so this is funnier than anything that's on TV now, man. And uh, they threw him off the air because he did a little stunt. He said, uh, okay, kids, what I want you to do is when your parents were asleep, go into your daddy's drawer, go into his wallet, and take out the little green papers with the pictures of the presidents on them, and send them to me, Soupy Sale. They had an address on the screen. I think he was even more specific than that. He said a picture of, of Abe Lincoln. Oh, did he say that? Okay. Yeah. And uh, kids actually got like a couple of thousand dollars in the mail. Like, who can't do he that? didn't. I don't think he got fired for that, but he got in a lot of trouble for that. Yeah, he got a lot. Of, well, I know. Uh, I remember he was off the air shortly after doing that. So they. Uh, the the classic clip of of Soupy Sales is he was uh, he always would go to his door. There'd be a knock on his door, oh, yeah. and then he would open yeah. it up, and there'd be some famous person there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You that, or there'd be a hand. You gotta help me. Yeah. My wife thinks she's my yeah. wife thinks she's a chicken. No, I didn't think yeah. it was like ours. We need the eggs to get it. Yeah, bump, 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 bump. And <laughs> and, and so there's there. a knock on the door. So he opens it up, and you don't see anything because the person is off screen, oh, yeah. and they had a naked lady there, uh, a <laughs> and yeah. he just yeah. broke up. He couldn't uh-huh. stop. Okay. <laughs> Also, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis, and Trini Lopez did a sketch on the Soupy Sale show. Really? Called the Waiter. It was hysterical. And they, they were in a restaurant, Soupy's the waiter, and you can imagine what happened. Everyone gets hit with pies at the end. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. The, so, Frank Sinatra did the Soupy Sale show back then. You know what? Every, every, it, these were the days when television wasn't national. Shows like this were local. Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. And every market had its own local uh-huh. kid star. Yeah. Um... Uh, we had one in San Francisco that the kids loved called Fireman Frank. Fireman Frank. You know. Uh, and uh, there, there were many other. Uh, there's a guy by the name of George Lamont uh, who was uh, very funny. Uh, I loved him. Uh, but we didn't know from Soupy Sales. We heard about Soupy Sales because all of a sudden Soupy Sales would be on the Ed Sullivan show, and now yeah. you knew who Soupy Sales was. Uh-huh. Uh, but every market had their own star. In fact, yeah. everybody goes, well, I watched Bozo the Clown when I was a kid. Yeah, which Bozo? Yeah. Because every different market had a different Bozo. Right. 
right. That's right. He's a different bozo. Um, uh, Pinto Colvig, I think, was the original bozo. Uh, he was both. Actually, how it started out, it was wasn't bozo the clown on TV. It was bozo the capital clown. Oh, I didn't you, know that. And what it was was a series of kids records on Capitol Records. Um, they were 78s, and they came in like an album, and you put them on, and it's, it's Bozo yeah, the Clown. I have been a and, and it was Pinto Colvig. And then they decided to go do it on TV. And then it did really well in L.A., I think, with Pinto Colvig. So they then started doing it in Chicago, but with a different person playing Bozo yeah, because the right. show was live, and another one in Philadelphia, another one in New York. And so yeah. on. And that's why everybody knew Bozo the Clown, but they didn't know the same Bozo the Clown. <laughs> yes, right. We had our own Bozo. We had Bill Britton. I think Larry Harmon, who invented Bozo. Larry, well, clown. Larry Harmon, I don't know that he invented Bozo, um, yeah, uh, but he did get he did get uh, claim to them to, uh -huh. to him, and uh, he he got he owned the franchise. Here's yeah. another franchise Larry Harmon owned, but I hate him for it. Well, he's dead now, so I. Oh, I don't dead. hate the dead, okay? <laughs> I just feel they went to their just reward, okay? Um, uh, Larry Harmon got the rights to Laurel and Hardy. Uh -huh. And any time you would want to do like a sketch about Laurel and Hardy or a parody of Laurel and Hardy, he would send you a cease and desist letter. Oh, my God. <laughs> Cut it out. Now, I had a friend by the name of Chuck McCann, another kid's show. I love host. Chuck McCann. I love Chuck McCann. God rest his soul. You know, it's funny. I got to know Chuck McCann. And kids like you say, Chuck McCann, I watched yeah. him all the time when I was a kid. And they go, great. You know, but I, that's not the Chuck McCann I knew. Chuck McCann I knew was Chuck McCann. It was a friend of my friend Earl Dowd's. Uh -huh. uh, and 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 so, uh, but everywhere I would go, everybody would go. Look, he's the he's the he's the kid show host, you know. And I'm going. I don't know from this. I just know this is Chuck McCann. But uh, Chuck um, uh, was very big uh, sure. in the day, and he also did an impression, a spot on impression, of uh, uh, Babe Hardy, Laurel uh -huh. and Hardy. And um, and then he did a, a, an act with a guy who did a perfect Laurel, Stan Laurel, and they would do Laurel and Hardy, cease and desist. Oh my God! <laughs> because he the guy he because what he did is he got Stan Laurel on his deathbed to sign away the rights to Laurel and uh, Hardy to him. Yikes! Yeah, the guy was not a great guy, you know. Ah, uh, okay. Well, every other audition in L.A. I used to go to in the 80s, he was there. You know, I go, oh, well, he's going to get the part, so he always did. So Yeah, but Larry Harmon was like, he owned Laurel and Hardy. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, Larry Harmon was a bastard. Okay. Yeah, so, well, I, 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 according to according to Chuck, he was. And I'd always see Chuck McCann in L.A. He was great. You know. <laughs> nice guy. But I like uh, and McCann, uh, McCann used to do a show here, I think, on WPIX. Yep, let's have yeah. fun. Let's have fun. Yeah. And... Um, <laughs> It's a great story he told me. He had a lot of great stories he would tell me. But one of the stories he told me was that uh, they had this show, and they had this uh, person on who was a beekeeper who brought his bees, uh -huh. right? Uh, and there was also a dog on this show who was, you know, now we have the bees, and we're going to show you a German shepherd, and blah, 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 blah. And the German shepherd knocked over the bee. Uh oh <laughs> Here we go. And the bees, thousands of bees, thousands of go bees. into the vents oh, at, KP, oh, at WPIX. Guy is doing the station breaks in a what they called the announcer's booth. There was a booth, and you would sit in it, and then you would sit there, and you would wait until you were cued, and then you would go. And this is why we don't have this job anymore. That's why a lot of us are out of work. He would just every half hour go, WPIX, New York. <laughs> and then he would go down to the bar, get drunk some more. Yeah, by right. five o'clock, by one o'clock in the morning, it's WPIX New York. <laughs> you know. He's in there ready to do it, and all the bees come into the announce oh. booth. <laughs> and this guy had to be taken to the hospital. WPIX, holy fucking shit! Ah! Mommy, but I think the I best story that McCann ever told me—I think McCann's dead now, isn't he? Yeah, he died. Oh, yeah, he died recently. That's a long um, time. He told me the story about how there was this guy on WPIX. You might remember him. 
who every Saturday night would do the Saturday night movies, and he had this rotisserie uh -huh. that he would be selling. And he would start out at the beginning of the show and say, tonight we're going to make a lovely pot roast. And then he would, skewer, <laughs> he would skewer the pot roast and he would put it in this little roasting thing. And he said, well, we'll come back and we'll see how it's doing. Enjoy the movie. And you watch a little bit of movie and come back and it's going around, you know. And he's saying, look how juicy it's starting to get. And then another part of the movie. And finally, at the end of the movie, he went up, see what well, we have, a lovely pot roast. Now, he didn't do that last... Uh, segment at the very end of the show because that was his last segment the movie yeah. went on and finished and they said this has been the saturday movie yeah. and blah 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 and he's halfway to new jersey by the time yeah. it's through. well what happens is every week they would roll in uh the uh, refrigerator you know and the rotisserie and the counter and things like that for him to work with and uh, at the uh, once every month, he would go down to the store and buy like five roast beefs to put on these skewers, and he would put them in the refrigerator, and then they would roll the refrigerator back and they'd plug the uh, the thing in so it was cool during the week, and then he would come back the next week take out one of the roast beefs. Well, on this one particular week, they forgot to plug in uh -oh. <laughs> the refrigerator. So he takes out the roast beef, and it smells horrendous. <laughs> but he says, okay, it may smell horrendous, but who's going to know the difference? This is television, right? So he puts it on the skewer, and he, <laughs> they start making the thing, and he goes, and he, and then uh, he comes in the middle of it. Look at it. It's getting better, and it's looking terrific, and luckily there aren't any flies chasing the thing. And it's smelling pretty horrible, okay? Uh, so finally he gets to the last one and says, and look, folks, a lovely roast beef. And then they go back to the movie, and he gets in his car, and he's halfway to the, uh, the tunnel uh, to New Jersey when all of a sudden he realizes that every week he knows the crew on the television show will always eat the roast beef. Oh, my God. Oh. Because it's sitting there, right? You just finished a roast beef, and these crew people love eating. Oh, my God. So he immediately does a U-turn, I think, in the Lincoln Tunnel and comes back to WPIX. And as he's pulling up, there's an ambulance. <laughs> oh, man. And, and he gets out, and they're rolling this guy into the ambulance, and they, he looks at him and goes, you son of a bitch. <laughs> It was the roast beef. <laughs> Those are the two great stories that Chuck oh McCann told. Oh my God! Oh my God! Didn't the yeah. crew like smell the turkey? Oh, we better yeah. not eat this, or we're hungry. We don't care. And speaking of other hosts, I mean, I was very good friends in the later years with John Zacherly, who was I a horror. Exactly. Hor hor yeah, you I see, I didn't know from Zacherly in California unless there was some kind of national TV show that decided to have Zacherly on yeah. on Halloween. But I got to know him because I worked with him at a radio station. He was working as a disc jockey. Uh -huh. And uh, he was a lovely man. Oh, he was well, just I, a lovely He was man. always in a different phase of my life. When I was a little kid, he had the monster show, and I used to love it. He hosted Chiller Theater on Saturday night. Yeah. And then when I got older and I was getting into rock and roll and FM radio, he was a disc jockey on, like, WPLJ or WPLJ. Right, right. Well, he was... Oh, he was actually playing Jimi Hendrix records. This is pretty he cool. Was over, he was over at uh, uh, WNEW FM. Yeah. And I'm the guy who convinced him to come over to, to us at WPLJ. So yeah, that's when he joined yeah. us. Sure. And uh, one time I'm out, we're, we're out on an afternoon, went to the beach or something, and we're eating in this little place, and these, these girls are starting to stare at us. Uh -huh. And he looks at me, <laughs> because he always talked like that. He really yeah. talked like that in real life. Says, exactly right Alex, right. I think they just saw a disc jockey and a horror host. <laughs> And I'm going, yeah, but I wonder which one they recognized first, yeah. you know, okay. and I knew it was him, you know. And, and when I would walk with him, people would go, oh, yeah, that's, that's Zachary, that's the guy. Yeah. The guy. <laughs> oh, yeah, he was a legend. Man. So you had all these local stars, and um, uh, they never intermixed. Today, it's syndicated, and one, oh, guy, one person stuff. goes everywhere. Uh, every place needs a local bozo or a Zachary or something yeah. like that. Yeah, so we lived in a simpler, easier time than it is. Right uh, channels now. two, four, seven, nine, eleven, and thirteen. Oh, That's you all. you had you had what 
two more than we did. We only had four. four. Five, seven, nine, we had we had we had channel seven. two, channel four, channel five, and channel seven. Oh, and channel nine okay. was the educational channel. Okay. In San Francisco. And that was it. That was it. Now yep. it's all now it's, a new world. Thousand channels and nothing but garbage. Then it was five channels and a lot of good stuff on it. Well, I'm glad to hear you're fine. Your AFib is gone. Uh, like bull. <laughs> yeah, and he's going to live another ten thousand years. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the face that is Stephen Pearl. Goodbye, Stephen. Thank you. Now in our sixth year, this is GabNet, the great American broadcast network. Talk like you've never heard it before. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Stephen Pearl. Let me see here. Do I have enough light? Is that light enough? Let, see, here, here's the thing. I can adjust this, and I, I just never know where to adjust it. You see, here's my other adjustment. There we go. That looks better. Yeah, that looks better. Anyway, I, you know, I never get this stuff set up. I, I did have it set up the other way on purpose, but I, I kind of like this better. Okay, anyway. Uh, let me see here. Uh, time to go to our, uh, our uh, little uh, thing here, our, uh, our, our Zoom, and uh, talk to our, our Zoom panelists uh, who will be assembling shortly. Um, if you don't know how to get here, just go over to gabnet.net and over on the right-hand side of the page, down in the middle of the right-hand side, it just says click here to Zoom. And that's all you have to do in order to be, well, like, uh, like Charlie Wallace is right now. And uh, here comes Robert Natale, ladies and gentlemen, uh, joining us again this evening from New Jersey. From New Jersey. Hey. He's from hey. Jersey. Hey, my all-time favorite soupy sales line. I yeah. took my wife to the baseball game. I kissed her between the strikes, and she kissed me between the balls. <laughs> yeah. I remember that. <laughs> did he actually do that on TV? Yes, he did. Did, yes, did he, he did. really? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, that show wasn't for kids. No, I don't no, care what no, anybody no, said. No, it never was. Never no. was. Right. Anyway, so how, are, how are you all tonight, folks? There we are, the first three that show up. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, hi. How are you, Jeff? Yeah, yeah. Let's get your face in there just right so you don't, you know, you're not slouching. Yeah, there we go. Oh, look at that. See? Uh, everybody's perfectly framed. That's the way it should be. Okay. Um, so uh, let me see here. I have nothing to talk about tonight. You know, I mean, other than what already everybody's talking about. Hey, uh, Alex. I've been meaning to ask you this for a long time. It's probably going to leave other people out, so I'll be quick. Did you, in your day, know Dan Ingram? No. You didn't? No. Did you? Uh, I know of I, his legend, the legend that is Dan Ingram, but I never knew Dan Ingram. He left about the time I got to New York. I see. He left, uh, for the, I think the West Coast is where he went to work. As yeah. about an 11 or 12-year-old old child he was an idol of mine i wanted to be in radio because of dan ingram and then later because of you but really? dan ingram's comedic style i thought was unmatched by anyone at least in my yeah radio. i uh, i heard nothing but wonderful things about dan ingram and the only thing i knew dan ingram for and what people would know him for is he was the voice on the hawaiian punch commercials <laughs> that's right that's right yeah uh, yeah. But he was a, a legend here in New York, and I don't know why he left. He wasn't fired. I think he just got a better job on the West Coast or something like that, you know. Well, then he came back to New York when uh, Bruce Morrow decided to gather all the old DJs uh, back on CBS to kind of reprise um, a lot of the good guys and um, <clears throat> a lot of WABC Ron Lundy, those kinds of guys that were mm. prominent at yeah. WABC in those days. And it worked for a few years, so I got to hear him again as an adult, and I still found them entertaining. Yeah, these guys could never come back and achieve the, the kind of stardom that they had originally when they first started out, and when they first became popular in New York. Dan Ingram was, a, 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 for people who don't know Dan Ingram was, he was a disc jockey, and he was... Probably the biggest disc jockey in this town. Mm -hmm. I mean, bar none. Everybody, everybody thought he was the best. Yeah. I never heard him, so I never know why he was great. Mm -hmm. You know, I worked with other greats. I mean, 
uh, I, you know, I worked with Murray the K, and right. I worked uh, with, uh, uh, I worked with uh, all the people that were WMCA when I got there, like uh, uh, Dan Harry Daniel, Harrison. Harry Harrison, right. Right. Uh, uh, what's his name, uh, the black guy. Uh, 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 oh, God. Did you know B. Mitchell Reed? No, I never knew B. B. Mitchell Reed, no. Okay. No. But when I came to, to WMCA, the, 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 these were big stars in this town. You know, Jack Spector yeah. uh, was another one. And um, who, who's the black guy? God damn it. We had the same birthday I did. Um, and he was, uh, he was smooth as silk. He was terrific. Uh, and um, uh, it was just a lot, of, uh, a lot of people that I worked with who were, were legends. And, of course, I'm just a kid. You know, I'm not a legend at all. I guess after a while I became a legend, or so I'm told. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, you know, I certainly wasn't going to become a legend with those guys around me, mm -hmm. you know, because I was just surrounded by greats. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I can't say I learned anything from them. The one I learned from, the one guy I worked with, that I learned how to do talk shows from, and it was kind of my mentor in a way, was, um, 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 uh, what's his name? Uh, but, oh, God damn it. What is wrong with me tonight? I can't. The talk show host on WMCA. Uh, uh, Not Bob Grant. No, 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 no. Oh, uh, Barry Gray. Barry Gray. Barry Gray. Mm -hmm. Barry Gray, I think, singularly was the best interviewer I ever heard in my life. Mm -hmm. no, no question about it. And I learned all my my uh, uh, interview chops from Barry Gray and watching Barry Gray work. And then they gave me his show on uh, the, he did, uh, he did Monday through Friday. And then on Saturday, they did a show in the same time slot out of his big studio. And they, they gave me that time slot and that studio to use. Mm -hmm. So um, what I did was kind of a, uh, a younger version of Barry Gray's show. And I brought in rock, people and so on and so forth. Nobody interviewed rock stars back then. I was the first one to do that. I would call up record companies and say, hey, have you got anybody with you I can have as a guest? And they go, what? You, <laughs> you know, because the only way they knew to push a music guy was by having him buy a station play his records. Right. And so I had people on like uh, Elton John's first American radio show was on my program, on that Saturday night program. Um, I had all the Grateful Dead save one. Pigpen wasn't there. I had every one of the Grateful Dead all smoking dope in my studio. <laughs> what they did is they came into the studio. See, I had had a, because I did kind of like a lot of hip people and things like that, you know, the other day. I said to, I got together with the lawyers one day and I said, what do I do if somebody pulls out a joint in the studio and starts smoking it? What, what are we required to do? And the lawyer said, nothing. Just as long as you don't partake. Right. In other words, they offer it to you, you turn it down. You don't take it. But if they smoke it, that's their problem. They're the ones committing, oh, Frankie Crocker. Yes, thank you much. Uh, uh, Frankie yeah. Crocker. We had the same birthday. Not the same year, but the same birthday. Dan Daniel had the same birthday as me. Three of us celebrated our birthdays wow. on the same day. Anyway, um, um, what was I saying? Where was, where was I going with that? Well, I'm losing my mind. Smoking that. pot in the studio. Oh, yeah, smoking pot smoking in the studio. Pot. So what they did is they came in, and one of them lit up, and then another one lit up, and then another one lit up. Before you knew it, all six of them, out of the seven, <laughs> uh, were all smoking pot. And on top of that, they were blowing it in my general direction. <laughs> So by the end of the hour, I could barely talk. I mean, I was less <laughs> I was less lucent than I am right now, and I'm forgetting names like crazy tonight. Uh, but that, you know, that really uh, that was that was a big uh, big thrill getting high on their on their weed on their stash. You actually got me into radio, but you also got me out of radio. I, I took a job as a freshman in college at the college radio station. Mm -hmm. They gave me an overnight shift. Mm -hmm. 
And I could do anything I wanted. I did what I wanted was play music and talk about the music, talk mm -hmm. about the individual players and all. And I was in my glory. I thought this is what I want to do for life. And then suddenly they switched my shift and it, it was against your shift. And so where I would play something and give a long, you know, speech about it, I would say, and I got a DeVita, see you in a minute, you know, like, and I would go listen to you. And finally, people complain. What happened to the show? You used to be so good. Yeah, In a God of Devita was the record you put on when you had to go take a long dump. Had to go take a shit. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. <laughs> no, you, you, we, we had we had long pee break records. Uh, in the early days when I was working at like pop radio stations, it was I think El Paso by Marty Robbins, which Marty was like Robbins. four and a half yeah. minutes, something like that. Yeah. Uh, later on, we were very lucky to have Arlo Guthrie with a 28-minute Alice's Restaurant and uh, Inagata De Vida, which was what, about 17 or 17 so? 17 and yeah. change, yeah. You could do a lot during that. You could have a woman come oh, in and have sex oh, with yeah. her and have her leave and maybe even take her out to dinner while that was on. <laughs> that's right. That's uh, right. Free, bird. Free Bird's a long one, too, right? Yeah, yeah. But there, was, so there were these long ones. I'll tell you what I did in San Francisco, though. Uh, I... Um, uh, I uh, I was working at a radio station, The Quake, and they decided, was it The Quake? No, it was, uh, it was, it was at Live 105, believe it or not, who said to me, um, listen, Alex, we'd really like it if you play more records in the morning. <laughs> I said, how many would you like me to play? They said, well, maybe 10 an hour would be nice. I said, that's most of the goddamn hour. They, yeah. they, they said, well, you know, because here's what happened with me. Hmm. I did a show in which I would talk. And I would bring in comedians, and they would talk. And we wouldn't play records. And these were record-playing radio stations. And so it became kind of like, the, the, there's a kind of a game they play called Invite the Jew Over to Dinner and See if We Can Make Him Eat Pork. Oh, You know? Uh, and uh, this was, let's see, always they tried to do it. How many records we can get Alex to play? So we got into a big fight one day. They said, you got to play a few more records. You're not playing enough music. And I went, but I am playing enough music, and I have control over this show by contract, and I don't want to play music, but I'm, I'm going to keep you happy tomorrow morning. And so I got on the air, and I said, good morning, everybody. This is Alex Bennett, and this morning I'm going to set a record for playing the most records in one hour. And what I did was there were a lot of records you could find, songs you could find that were like a minute and a half, 45 seconds, sure. uh, you know, you know, they, they were out there. So I managed in an hour back to back to play, I think it was 30 songs in one hour. And that was with the commercial breaks. Okay. And after the hour was over, I said, from here on in, this is the morning show at KILT, your most music morning show. <laughs> no other radio station can beat the amount of music we just played, you know. And and uh, my boss said, "Very funny, <laughs> very funny." That was the last thing we wanted. Well, well, another time, this would happen at the Quake. Okay, the Quake was uh, very mad at me because they wanted to get rid of me. The reason they wanted to get rid of me is that they bought me as part of the package when they bought, they bought the, the radio station failed. Somebody else bought it. Then they decided what they wanted to do with it, but what they wanted to do with it wasn't what I was doing. And I had built in and baked into my contract the specification that I had creative control over my show. And they said to me, we want you to play 10 records an hour. I said, really? They said, yeah, tomorrow morning, start playing 10 records an hour. So I figured out, how am I gonna do this? So I got on the air and I said, listen, the management of the radio station has told me that they want me to play 10 records an hour. And I said, there's no way we can do 10 records an hour and do the kind of show I do. So here's what I'm going to do. On the left channel of your stereo, you'll hear the music. And on the right side of your, of your uh, channel, you'll hear me doing my show. There you go. Now all you have to do is take that balance knob and move it to which side you want. That's and good. I did an hour with both channels going, and they went crazy. They, want, they were looking for reasons to, you know, I did something <laughs> illegal, uh, the FCC wouldn't like this, uh, you know, that we were causing this problem. 
And I went, yeah, fuck you. You know, I mean, that was the kind of troublemaker I was, you know. <laughs> But I, I played uh, played ten records. I think I played maybe twelve or fifteen records that hour. It didn't matter, you know. Yeah. And I was just playing them. Um, I I I had done this thing where I just made sure that all the, I think each pot that we had, you kind of had a balance knob, and I could turn things to different channels, and uh, that's how we did it. So I was I was they loved me. My bosses just loved the hell out of me. Yeah, but going to live one of five was much much better. Right? I mean, a bigger audience and everything, right? I mean, uh, yeah, um, yes, and from the yeah, quake? yeah, yeah. From the quake, well, the quake was a. Um, the reason I went to the, I was at KMEL, which was a kind of a pop radio station, and they were nice people. They were wonderful to me. Uh, but um, I get a call one day, and I get it from a guy named Bob Pittman, of all people. Now, if you MTV. don't know this name. Well, Bob Pittman is the guy who's now the head of iHeartRadio. Right. And he's the guy that came up with MTV, MTV. and started MTV. Yep. So uh, they say, you, you got a call from uh, Bob Pittman. And he wants you to call him in New York. And I went, whoa, MTV, here I come. And I call him, and he says, hi, Alex, uh, Bob Pittman here. Listen, I'm friends with so-and-so, and they want to talk to you about going to work for them across town. But they can't approach you because they could get sued for doing that. So they asked me to be the intermediary and link the two of you together. So would you be willing to talk to them? And I said, yeah, I'd be happy to. Next thing I know, ring, ring, they're calling me. And they go, well, how much do you want to come over here? And I, I, don't know, I was making something like 60 grand a year, and that was pretty good money at, at that time. Um, maybe I have 75, something like that, because at one point I was going to leave the station and come back to New York, and they said, how much would it, how about, some, uh, why don't you stay? And I said, well, they said, we really like you here. And I said, okay, I'll stay. And they said, okay, we're raising you to 60000 a year. I was making like thirty five, mm -hmm. which was really nice of them. said, just so you'll stay, because you're very valuable to us. Well, anyway, these guys call up. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm doing great over at this other radio, at the KMEL. I don't need to go over to that other radio station. Um, and uh, they said, how much, how much do you want to come over to, to go to the, this new radio station we're starting? We're thinking of calling it the Quake. I said, so I, I didn't want to go. So I said $125,000. And the next words out of their mouth were, okay. So. So I then went to work with them for a lot for more money, I think, than anybody in New in San Francisco was making at that time. That was a lot of money back then. Um, maybe there was one other guy making that much, but uh, I was pretty much it, and I went over to, there to Live 105, and uh, uh, rather to the Quake, and uh, uh, the rest was history. The station went broke. Because the guy who ran the station was stealing the proceeds from the station and going out, I don't know, spending it on hooker girlfriends, I don't know what. And so they finally had to sell the station. And when they sold the station, the people who bought it didn't want this talk show in the morning. What do you have a talk show in the morning on a rock station for? <laughs> so they tried to get me to play music, and I said I wouldn't because I had it in my contract that I didn't have to. And then they tried to do everything. Then they said, well, then we'll do this, and we'll do this to get rid of you. And it turned out there was no way they could get rid of me. I had an ironclad, no-cut contract for three years, and they still had a year and a half left, or maybe more, uh, to pay it off. So they were stuck with me until somebody came along over at Live 105, and his name was Ed Cramp, and he said, I'm going to make a baseball kind of deal for you guys. What I will do is I'll, I'll take Alex Bennett off your hands, and I will pay half the salary you're paying to help mitigate your losses, okay? And the minute he gets a rating as high as he gets, uh, he's been getting on your station, uh, uh, I'll, we, we'll accept the entire amount, okay? We'll start paying the entire amount as soon as the ratings are as high as what he got you over there. And they thought about it for a moment, and they said, "No, nah, we'll go the uh, we'll, we'll go. Uh, you pay, you pay forty. We'll pay forty percent. You pay sixty. So he says, "Okay." 
And so I went over. And the first month that I was there, I got better ratings than I got over mm. at the Quake. And they mm -hmm. would have been off the hook for the next, two, what was it, year and three quarters. But for a year and three quarters, I was being paid by two radio stations. <laughs> it's crazy. Quake, Quake was San Jose, right? It was in San Jose? Yeah. Well, they were, when they were trying to get rid, rid, rid of me, no, no, the Quake was San Francisco. Oh, it was? Okay. When they were trying to get rid of me, um, uh, they had a meeting uh, between my lawyers and their lawyers. And at some point in the meeting, the guy who owned the radio station said something to the effect of, I hear Alex has a drinking problem. <laughs> now, I'd never had a drinking problem. Why you would assume I had a drinking problem is... Any party you ever saw me at, I was drinking a Coke, right? So people automatically assume he goes to a party, there's alcohol, he doesn't drink, he, the Coke, he, must, be an, he must be an alcoholic. So the guy said, uh, I hear Alex an alcoholic. And uh, the lawyer said, no, he's not. And then when they wanted to try and get rid of me, they said, we're not willing to negotiate any further. And they said, why? He said, because you just committed secondary defamation. Mm -hmm. In other words, secondary defamation is when you don't say, I am an alcoholic. You say, I heard he was an alcoholic. But they said, that's secondary defamation. We got you dead to rights. Now, you want to get sued? Or you want to, you know, uh, let him out of his contract? So I went out, and I didn't work for a couple of months. It was then a couple of months later that this Ed Cramp came up with this idea about buying part of my contract. But all that time, I was getting paid. So, yeah, a little adventures of Alex Bennett in San Francisco. So, so that was your cocktail, huh? Coke and Coke? Coke and Coke, yeah. Coke and Coke. Oh, Co Coke and Coke. Let me see here. Here, here. Hockey Sockham. This has got to be John Larkin, of course. Yeah. Yeah. You're not surprising us, John. Yeah, no, he's... He's hiding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what? So anyway, I, I hate telling radio stories. I leave that up to Jack Bishop. I don't tell. I don't like to tell radio stories that much. Uh, oh, they're great. But yeah. you know, those little adventures I love because it was you know a matter of how I played with these guys. Because management and I, I used to have when I was at the Quake. God, I hope I'm not boring you guys with this. Mm -hmm. When I was oh. at the Quake, I had a program director. who I didn't exactly hate him, but I didn't like him very much. So I used to like to go into his office whenever we would have a meeting and start yelling and screaming at him and calling him all kinds of names because he would just take it very placidly. <laughs> and I'd go, you son of a bitch, you motherfucker. <laughs> I'm pounding my fist on the table, and he's going, well, if that's how you feel. You know, so I always wanted to see if I could ever get something out of him, but I didn't hate him. But I always felt a, uh, an animosity, uh, not, not an animosity, that's not the case, because like I had a, a program director at Live 105 I like named Richard Sands, but yet we would always argue like crazy, because I always felt that management was, at, was my enemy, okay? They, they were what came between me and doing a good radio program. And, and uh, uh, you know, if the natural enemy of the cat is the vacuum cleaner, then the natural enemy of the disc jockey is the general manager. You know, so. That's my history in the business. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. You were in New York when... Um Patty Hearst got kidnapped, yep. and that was compelling radio. That was can't miss well, radio. Well, the story I don't tell that often, I don't think I've ever told it here, is I got a call from somebody at home saying, Alex Bennett, I said yes. They said, um, how would you like to interview Patty Hearst? And I said, well, where is she? And they said, She's here on the East Coast. I said, really? They said, she's yours, but we want X number of dollars, I think it was several thousand dollars, and she'll do an interview with you. We'll take you out to a location, bring a tape recorder. We won't tell you where we're going. You can interview her. Because they knew, number one, that I would be sympathetic to her, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and secondly, 
uh, they knew that I wouldn't rat on where she was and things like that. I just had a good reputation that way. So I went to my boss and I said, listen, I can get an interview with Patty Hearst, but it's going to cost us two grand. And their attitude was, we can't pay that. You know, we, we won't pay to do an interview. And I said, you know, you're probably right. We shouldn't pay to do an interview. So I told these guys the next time they called, the answer is we can't do it for money. We can do it for free, but we can't do it for money. And they said, well, then all bets are off, and that was it. Well, I often wondered whether that was a call was for real. And many, many years later, I think it was actually it was a thing that CNN did a couple of years ago on Patty Hearst. They talked about where she went. And exactly at that time, she was in New Jersey. Hmm. Yeah. So um, uh, that, that, was a, that was a little adventure. But I had to turn it down. And I agreed with my bosses. You don't pay for an interview. Yeah. You know. Right. You buy him a Coke or something like that, but you don't, you know, you don't. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a bad precedent. It, it's a bad precedent, and you just don't pay for it. So, uh, But uh, that, that was as close as I came to doing that. You know, uh, but but I didn't know if it was for real or not. And I told people this story and they went, oh, OK, that's an interesting story. Yeah. And then I went and saw this documentary and they they were interviewing the guy who was keeping her at a house in New Jersey. They would dr driven her all the way out here across the country and taken her to New Jersey because nobody would be able to be just too remote to find her. You know, she could just blend in and. Um, uh, so I, I had that uh, verified for me. So, hey, Alex. Yeah. You remember um, what was the guy Paul Paul Krasner? Yeah. Yeah, you knew him, didn't you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. And, uh, he he um, he published. Uh, remember May Brussel? May Brussel. No, is... May Brussel. Yeah, no, May, May Brussel. Brussel. It was pronounced. Was it Brussel? Yeah. Okay. I always thought it was Brussels. Anyway, she um, he published some of her conspiracy writings, and uh, was it uh, Lennon? John Lennon read it, and he he needed to, Krasny needed some or Krasner needed money to publish it, and so John Lennon funded it or something like that. Did you ever hear that story? Well, I know that I funded the Realist, which was his magazine. He was having trouble keeping the doors open. Oh, okay. And I, he asked if I could uh, lend him the money. And I said, okay, how much do you need? He said, $5,000. I said, okay. And I had my business manager cut him a check for $5,000. And my business manager said, well, how, how long is it going to take for him to pay it off? And I said, don't expect him to pay it off. I said, I'm going to lend somebody $5,000. I'm not expecting to see it back. You know, if it comes back, surprise, surprise, you know, and, and whatever. Yeah. And sure enough, one day we get a check in the mail from Paul Krasner. It's for $5,000 to pay me back. Uh, but uh, Krasner and I were at Woodstock together. And in fact, we both came home at the same time, which was uh, a, a day early, because I had to do a, a live show in New York on a Saturday night. That was that Saturday night show I was talking to you about. So I went on Friday, and Krasner was there on Friday, and we stayed overnight there. And then we, he wanted, he had to come back too because he was dating a, 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 a soap opera star, um, and um, and I had to go back to do the show. So we got in the car and I you said, know, "Can you give me a ride back to New York?" And you know, I mean, Krasner and I were good friends over the years. Yeah. So <laughs> that's that story. Any any other old <laughs> war stories you want to hear? Um, you know, um, so, you know, uh, you know, I've, I've had a, you know, a good career and now I'm ready to drop dead, you know, <laughs> not soon though, right? Well, I don't know, man. I mean, uh, because of my union, I don't know if I have the money to stay alive, <laughs> you know, so. by the way, I went online, the union, they haven't been. been People have been writing stuff online. They're actually, I, I put a thing up and I said, uh, uh, I wrote, uh, there was this site and I signed up for it. And then I wrote as my little thing. I said, does anybody know where we can get one of those big, you know, scab rats 
blow up scab rats mm -hmm. to put in front of the SAG offices. I said, nothing a union would hate more than to have a scab rat in front of their union offices. And the guy wrote me back and said, that's a great idea. We should probably do that in Burbank, at their <laughs> offices in Burbank. And I went, well, I don't know where you can get a scab rat. I know where you can get a civet cat pretty easily. Yeah, yeah. No, but you know, <laughs> they do. If we survive. Believe it or not, go online. <laughs> Go online, type in scab rats, and there's actually a place that rents them out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm With thinking. With a jumper. They have jumpers, too. I, I'm thinking, uh, what? Jumpers? Yeah, the kids. You know, the kids' jumpers, you know, for the parties? Oh, no, 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 no. There was none of that. And then you didn't have any of those those air guys who go like this, you know. Yeah, none right. of those either. Exactly, yeah. You know. Uh, uh, but I... Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah yeah so um um uh, i uh you know i i'm thinking maybe if, if they're not too expensive i'll get one of those rats and just go down here to sag after it and set it up you know and then get a little picket sign and go sag is not nice to their older performers as it were you know, but we have, they, they, a lot of people were like saying stuff uh, there. Hillary Swank is suing the union over her medical. That's what it says. Yeah, really? uh, yeah. and wow. um, uh, these guys are thinking of, of taking some actions against them to try and prevent them from go, going into this new phase of whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, a lot of people, a lot of a lot of people you know, you know, um, who who are are. Uh, I saw a thing that uh, Viola Davis wrote today in which she said, hey, when the air conditioner starts, my, my lights dim. Um, she said, Viola Davis, that uh, the, the uh, what is it, the, uh, the unemployment rate right now is at 8.4, but the unemployment rate among actors is 95%. Wow. Okay, 95%. And she says, it's a shame, you know, that this kind of thing has to be done at a time when actors aren't able to find work, you know, and they certainly can't yeah. get the get enough. Uh, well, who's Brian Sigmund? Well, we'll see. Let me see here. Maybe it's somebody we know and they're just... Bathtub. Huh? Yeah, bathtub guy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, Br Brian Sigmund. Let's see oh, where yeah. he is now. <laughs> oh, he was in the bathtub last time. Hello, Brian. Are you there? Turn on your camera. Yeah, what's up, Alex? Turn on your camera, Brian. Yeah, Unless you're in the shower. Oh, there you are. He's oh, back. In the shower. Oh, there you go. <laughs> in the shower. He's again. back in the shower again. Don't stand <laughs> up. That's that's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> what is that in the way? What is that? Oh. I'm sorry. I'm just positioning this thing. Okay. Well, I'll leave it be. What is it? A phone you're using? That's a phone. Yeah. That's a phone. Well, just don't let it fall into the tub. Yeah, well, it, there's a nice contraption here. I built this, like, desk thing. I spend a lot of time in the bath. Really? So it, 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 it's propped up nice. It won't fall. Oh, really? Oh, okay. All right. I was just thinking maybe we were doing a, a version of Marat Saad. Nobody gets that joke here, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, Jean Marat was killed, uh, or uh, Marquis de Saab was killed by a, a woman named uh, Marat. In his bathtub, so they did a play called Marat Saad, which was about that. I was Pretty just sophisticated guy. You know all about hey, Marat Saad, don't you, Tony? No, I'm sure of my <laughs> No, if it, were, if it were a comic book, he'd know it, but otherwise, he doesn't know it. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so you know, those, those are some war stories, um, uh, and. Uh, I can't think of any uh, any else that would be interesting, you know. Oh, what I was saying about the union, though, is that if you go online, there are just some amazing people saying things about about this, and then everybody likes send money in so that they could get, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, this, this site that they, what, what's it called? Uh, uh, the domain? Uh, no, no, it's like it's like uh, GoFundMe, but it's not GoFundMe. It's for like causes uh, and uh, it, it, they asked you if you would put uh, if you would put uh, uh, give some money so that they can promote it more.
So I gave him 40 bucks. And I looked at the other people who were giving 40 bucks, and it was some people you would really know, you know? I mean, this is a union with some pretty famous people in it. Oh, sure. You know, and, but it's, a, it's funny that the famous people aren't... Um, uh, uh, aren't, aren't the ones that are really going to be hurt by this that much because, mm -hmm. hey, number one, they're making the money and they work enough, although it's fun, uh, you have to make $35,000 a year to get the best insurance they have. If you're not one like me, the, mine was a senior performer's insurance, but uh, forget that. If you're just normal, you have to make $35,000 a year to get the best insurance they've got. Make at least that. Work at least 84 days, something like that. So then on top of that, used to be that if you got, a, if you got uh, residuals, which is payment for work you've done, and they just send you residuals, yeah. which I still get to this day. Do you know who sent me, I've gotten the most money for in my career over the years? Bill Maher. Yeah. Really? I introduced, oh I did a, he did a one night stand for HBO. I was the announcer. <laughs> and they've kept running that thing for the last 25 years. <laughs> okay. That was at the Fillmore. Yes. So if I you worked that, I worked that show. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I, I ushered it. <laughs> uh -huh. So, I mean, uh, I, uh, I've made a fortune off of, off of, uh, 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 off of Bill Maher, who is not my favorite comic of all time, but what the hell. Uh, yeah. and, uh, but I made a lot of money off of it. Well, if you get residuals, they used to be able to be a considered income and go against that 25, what was then 25,000, but now the 35,000, your residuals would count as income, all right? right? If you're getting a pension from them, you can't use the residuals as income for them. Ready? Mm. Ready for that one? You know. Uh, then I started to think about it. Take a guy like James Earl Jones. Mm -hmm. I mean, he must, when it's time to go to the mailbox every day, the question is not whether he's getting a residual check, but how many are going to be there. Okay? Right. Under this new rule, because he isn't doing a lot of new work, yeah. okay? He probably can't get life insurance from the union. You know, so I mean, you hear all these kind of horror stories, and you're going, you know, come on, this is why you join a union. That's why people are a union. You know, it's the collective yeah. bargaining, and we're all going to uh, pitch in. The reason you have a union is so you can have a health plan. You know, I've told comics before comics don't have health plans. Uh, and I've said, you've got to unionize. And it's not because you want to go make more money from the club owners. It's so that you can get a health plan because you're now a group and you can have a health plan. And so, you know, a health plan is always the core of any union. You know, it's, it's one of the things that they, that they make a big deal out of. So, I, you know, it's kind of sad. Boy, I love seeing a guy in the bathtub. It, it, it's, <laughs> you know who makes a ton of money off of residuals? Apparently, who? Anyone who ever like worked on the SU, uh, that SVU, Law and Order. Oh, Law and Order. They play, oh Jesus, uh, they play the crap yeah. out. Of, yeah. Well, yeah, they play the crap out of them, but they've also been on for how many years? Twenty years, something like that. Yeah, there's twenty. I don't it's yeah, I don't even now, yeah. anymore. I, I all I see is the SVU. But yeah, you know, I just get I get tired of like just child predators all the time. I, I like the old. Uh, Richard Belzer never has to work another day in his life. I mean, mm -hmm. again, he goes down to the mailbox, and you know, there's the residual checks. I thought he died. Did, uh, oh. Bell, did Bells die? I don't think so. I don't think so. Oh, I'm thinking of the other guy. You just think he's dead because you don't see him anymore. No, no, I was thinking of the other guy that was on that show. You, the guy that was the Broadway singer guy. Oh, Jerry oh, Orbach. Jerry Orbach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. He passed away. Yeah. yeah, another guy, by the way, residual heaven, because yeah. he did commercials like crazy. Yeah. You know, I used to tell stories about going down for auditions here in New York, for announcer auditions. You know. And they would do it. They would do it. They would do a cattle call, 
Uh, but you'd be sitting there, right? You know, they'd call you up and say, would you like to come down and audition for a commercial? And you go, yeah, sure, why not? You know, I got nothing to do during the day after I'm through with my show. I'll go down there and just try and get a commercial. And you go down there, and you're sitting there looking at the copy, you know, and you're mulling it over and seeing how you're going to read it. And uh, all of a sudden, on the side of your ear, you hear somebody say, I'm here for the auditions. And you go, and your name? Orson Welles. And you get up and leave. <laughs> and you just go. <laughs> and you would do the same thing if you heard Jerry Orbach. In fact, I think yeah. one of the auditions I went to, Orbach was there, you know. <laughs> Uh, I, I went into an audition once for, uh, I didn't know, sometimes they would ask you to come to the audition because they heard you on the radio and they want to see what you look like, and these women were the casting agents, so you, you know, they'd call you up, can you come down? Sure. Okay, now we'll get to see what Alex Bennett looks like. <laughs> and so I would show up, and I went in to do this commercial, it was for certs. Oh, I wonder if I do that. Come on, sir. It's just a fucking minch of Tony. She likes that uh, stuff. <laughs> and uh, they give me the copy, and they they give it to me in the in the announce booth. I don't get to see it ahead of time, and I look at it. And okay, okay, they say, okay. Alex, go. And I start reading it, and it goes. Susan knows a lot about skinny knits, but what she doesn't know is she has ho hum mouth. That's a bit. And as soon as I hit ho hum mouth, I started breaking up. I couldn't. I got hysterical. I couldn't stop laughing. And they said, "Is there a problem, Mr. Bennett?" I said, "No, no, no. Let me let me try it again." And I went. Susan knows a lot about skinny knits, but the one thing she doesn't know is she has. I couldn't even get the the word out this time because it was just I anticipated what I was going to have to say. They said, would you like to try it again, Mr. Bennett? And I said, sure. And I said, uh, Susan knows a lot about skinny knits, but what she doesn't know is she has... <laughs> and they finally said, is there a problem, Mr. Bennett? And I said, yes. This script is the biggest piece of crap I've ever written, written <laughs> read, rather. And they said, next. <laughs> You know, uh, I mean, I, it, but I hated going in for those auditions. They were just terrible. And the only time I ever got a commercial was when a friend offered it to me, you know. Uh, my friend Earl Dowd had some kind of account he was doing commercials for. So he put me on one of them. And you get one commercial, you get a lot of residuals for it. You know, if it's for a major, major product, which this was. I can't remember what it was now. And I think I did it with Selma Diamond. Remember Selma Diamond? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. But anyway, that, that was I I I never I never was very good at at uh, doing voiceovers. Not because I didn't have a good voice, but because I was very bad at auditioning. I hated the audition process. Uh, and uh, so anyway, that's my life. Uh, well, we got 25 minutes left. Any other war stories you want me to tell? This is War Story Night. Oh, a lot of people are watching, too. I just know. I looked over there and went, what? People are interested in this crap? Anyway. Oh, yeah. Anyway, uh, let's, uh, let's see here. What's happening in the news? Jeff. What? Jeff's got his hand up. Jeff's got his hand up. Oh, yes, yeah. Jeff. Tell us about Florida. <laughs> you know something? I would rather not tell you about Florida. <laughs> <laughs> that was the worst most horrible experience in my life taking a job in Florida, W I O D, uh, which stood for Island of Dreams, uh, oh and uh, we, I did a talk show down there, and it was just it was horrible. It was I lasted three months. I couldn't stand it. I just couldn't stand it. Those are the worst people in the world. Those people down there, you know, they should all rot in hell. You know, eventually. Global warming is coming, as we can see in California. I mean, is that global warming or is that global warming? Yeah. Man, I saw pictures of San Francisco today. We have a thing called the Palace of Fine Arts. Don't ask me what it is. They don't know what it is. It's just this thing they built for the 1916 Pan American Exposition, and nobody ever thought to tear it down. So one day they said, 
it's falling apart. Let's plaster it up and restore it. And so it's there. It's on a little lake and stuff. And it's one of the wor worst pieces of art you've ever seen in your life. I can't explain why to you, but if I had a camera and I could show it to you, I would Let's explain see. why it sucks. But anyway, it's, it's, it's art. Uh, uh, what, what, what do they call it? Uh, uh, when there's art that's ba so bad it's good, you know. But anyway, um, they showed this, and it's, it's orange in color. Mm -hmm. And so all of San Francisco is now orange. The sky, the smoke, mm. everything, orange. And, of course, the Palace of Fine Arts. I said, well, nothing new there. <laughs> you know? um, but as I, said, as I said last night, it was so orange. How orange was it? Tony, say how orange was it. How orange was it? Oh, okay. Thank you, Brian. So orange that if Donald Trump went to visit, he'd disappear. <laughs> Try the field. It was better today. There's, there's no sun today, but it was gray. It wasn't or smoky. It wasn't wasn't orange. So they said it's like it's like a sunset. How when the sun gets to a certain there's certain atmosphere or whatever reflects yeah. the orange. Well, my business manager lives over in Marin. Said at least yesterday it was so bad. That at noon, it was like it was midnight. Yeah. He said, in fact, yeah. it was so dark, the street lights went on. Oh. It, it reminded me of like a solar eclipse. Yeah. It was really weird. I mean, it is just, it's horrible out there. You guys have got a bad, uh, bad thing going for you out there. Yeah. Well, everything started with the lightning storms on that Saturday morning. Yeah. That's what set up the majority of them. And then, you know, then a couple other stupid ones, but. Well, the stupid ones is a gender reveal party yeah, in which they sent up uh, fireworks that were blue yeah. and st certainly turned red and burnt down half of Southern California. <laughs> yeah, what is so, that? Is that legal? That's not legal, is it? What? No, they're, they're going to get shooting. They're going to get fined. Or... They're going to get fined? How much do you fine somebody for yeah. burning down half of California? They yeah. were projecting eight million dollars, and I don't think that people have eight million dollars. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the people who hold the gender reveal party probably go, "Oh well, we're in trouble now." <laughs> you know, it's going to take a long time to pay this off. The, the big problem is our fire season really isn't until next month. Ooh. Yeah, but try and tell me there isn't right, Charlie. There isn't yeah. global warming. You know. I mean, this is what global warming is. We've had so many of the, I mean, California always had forest fires every, every summer, late summer. And the reason we have them is because it is part of actually nature's way of regrowing new trees because the trees burn and then the seeds pop and then they go into the ground and soon there's a whole new forest. So it's part of, it's part of nature. But then these aren't part of nature. This is just nature gone wild, and it's because, you know, I mean, they're, 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 it, it's global warming that's causing it. I'll tell you what, it's not just a West Coast phenomenon. On the East Coast here, we've noticed we, it, it doesn't rain here anymore in the summer. They're vicious storms, but, mm. but it doesn't just simply rain. And the other thing is, I don't think in my first 60 years I heard a tornado warning. And now in the past 10 years, it feels like I hear a couple a month. You yeah. know, that's just simply different. Yeah, you're not, you know, uh, we're having that uh, in other mm -hmm. parts of the world. We're having other events that are, uh, you know, similar. Uh, Brian and then Jeff. But, yeah. So two, two years ago when we had the, the, the last bad ones, last year wasn't that bad, but two years ago, and they burnt down. Oh, yeah, I remember when... Uh, they went over your uh, the the storage you had. Remember, you had all your stuff in the storage that year. So two years ago, they, they yeah I had I have st my stuff in storage and yeah. everything around the storage burned. unit burned to the ground, except the storage facility. So that year, two years ago, it burned down the city of Paradise. You guys probably maybe you've heard that. Just leveled it. <clears throat> so. Now they've been rebuilding these last two years, and one of those fires are headed towards paradise again. Uh, yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. So it's so sad because you see the you see the the house framed, you know, with the with the plywood around it. And, I mean, they were starting to rebuild in paradise. 
They've been rebuilding. The I'd last say two years I'd say they... wait for two years and then maybe rebuild. <laughs> move out of paradise. No more paradise. Yes, uh, Jeff, you had your hand up. Yeah, I th I, there's uh, something that I thought maybe uh, you guys would find it a little interesting. My, uh, I have a son who's uh, 27, 28 years old, mm -hmm. and he was in our house for a couple of weeks, and he and he works a he works in Manhattan, mm -hmm. but he works at home now in Brooklyn. Yeah, and he was getting totally bored because he can't go anywhere. You know, it's yeah. just nothing going on. And so uh, he asked my wife if, if he could borrow her car and take it for a couple of weeks. And over the weekend, he can go to the beach or to go up to, to the mountains right. or something and see people around. So he goes, it's a great idea. Okay. And so she goes, yeah, this is okay. But why don't you park it somewhere not on the street in Brooklyn. It's too dangerous, too crazy. You, you got to find a good place to park it. Well, he, he never really did that. So all of a sudden, he's driving a car. He's having a good time over the weekend. He gets back on me one day. Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, the car sounds like the whole muffler was ripped off or broken or whatever. Yeah. And she goes, what did you do? You must have hit a bump or gone through a pothole or whatever. He goes, no, I wasn't even driving that car. Blah, 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 this isn't it. So she goes, well, you better bring it into the place and figure out what the heck is going on. She brings it in, and the guy goes, somebody stole your Cadillac uh, converter. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, Cadillac converter. <laughs> they actually sawed it off. Yeah. Money, 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 money. Yeah, they oh, were yeah. doing that for a long time. Yeah, those things are, are yeah. worth a lot of money. By the way, the reason everybody you're seeing Brian Sigmund's name is he's probably walking around naked right now. And he, <laughs> he right, Brian, are you there? Oh, we can't even hear him. He's, yeah, he, no, I, oh. I, I can hear her. I'm just, yeah, I'm about to. I mean, if you want to say it, no, 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 no. <laughs> No, Brian, please don't. You know, I'm not allowing these shows to be monetized lately, but it, I don't want to get them taken off altogether, you know. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, yeah. So, anyway, uh, you know, I'm a little on the tired side. Somebody said Art Deco. No, uh, Mike Allen, it wasn't Art Deco I was thinking of. It was uh, Art Greco. Uh, no, uh, it was kitsch is the term I'm thinking of. It's a kind of art called kitsch that it's so bad it's good. You know, like, oh, a good example would be, uh, oh, I don't know, cats on black velvet. Okay? You know, things like that. So anyway, so uh, today our, uh, our uh, Senate uh, didn't pass a bill, but it was the Democrats that didn't let it happen because they didn't want this thin bill, as it's called. Uh, to be passed. How do you feel about that? You lefties, you. <laughs> Was this a, the response to the um, COVID, whatever? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, they want to, they just want to pay the, the co corporation. They don't want to give anything to the people. Nope. Yeah, that's what, yeah. Well, as you're saying, there's no money, no money for any of the help that's needed. Yeah. I still can't believe that a bigger fuss hasn't been made about the lack of um, the lack of visibility as to where the original money went. Yes. You know, yes. That, that was like $7 billion or something that just mm -hmm. nobody. Oh, I think it was a trillion. I oh, think it was so. a trillion, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it was It was it's over half a, a half a trillion dollars. It's still left over. Mm -hmm. No There's accounting whatsoever. Yeah, no. Mnuchin got None. to send it to anybody he wanted and didn't have yep. to tell us who he sent it to. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, but I mean, I, I just, I, it's amazing. It's just amazing uh, that, that we can't get money to the people who need it. Right. You know? Yeah. Yes, Meanwhile, Jeff. Meanwhile, there's like 40 I know somebody, people facing eviction. Yeah. Uh, I know somebody who got some of this money because they had a little startup company. 
Mm -hmm. It's a one-person startup. And they're really not doing it, buddy. And somebody calls them up and says, we can give you money for this and take care of that. And, and uh, you can pay for that for the next six months or whatever. And the thing was really illegal. It, it was mm -hmm. really a... Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Mm. Mm. It's on payroll. Wow. Yeah, well, it's like, very strange. Well, we and, we had some we had somebody who used to call this show who was getting some of that money. Yeah. Um, who we haven't heard from in a while. I, I don't know why he just decided not to call. I have to admit, on a, on a rather visceral part of me, misses him from the standpoint that I would like to be ragging on him right now about Trump's yeah, he, whole. Yeah. COVID thing and all that has gone that and you've got a recording of him saying this stuff. You know? Yeah. I mean yeah. it's not it's not like you can go, oh well he didn't really say that. What do you mean he didn't really say it? You know, he said it. Came out of his mouth. <laughs> so there's a there's an evil part of me that would like to be doing battle with that guy right now. But you know, he chooses not to call so I'm not I'm choosing not to say his name. Uh, who has his hand up? Charlie has his hand up, and then yeah. also uh, uh, um, uh, Brian. Brian has his hand up. Brian uh, I got with the one. Friends on Facebook that that say that the what's his name doctored the tape. Trump didn't really say that. Trump right. never said that he doctored the tape. It's a fake no. tape. He doctored the tape. That's what some of the guys I'm arguing with on Facebook are saying. He's, he's well, admitted it. Uh, he's admitted saying that. But yeah. he said that he just want to panic America. Right. Well, that doesn't matter. They'll say he faked that too. That he never admitted it. He didn't he panic America panic. with all the people coming from Central America when the caravan. Yeah, right, right? right. Every day they had the caravans coming and going to rape your wives and yeah, yeah. And, that, and that all kinds of colored people are going to move to the suburbs and scare yeah, your oh, my children. One. But no panic. panic no there. panic. <laughs> no panic. <laughs> I'm looking for my Snapple. Okay, anyway. So, I mean, yeah, no, I mean, it's amazing because he did say it. I mean, it's it's just, it's right there. If there's anything about that tape, and I mentioned this last night, that kind of got to me was the fact that how lucid Trump sounded yeah. on those tapes. I mean, it wasn't the kind of Trump we're used to having right now who mispronounces words and he says stuff wrong. He was very lucid and very... Direct, okay. That's because he was telling yes. them the truth. It's when he's trying to lie, they're trying to. Keep you, you know, you got a very good lie. point there, Charlie. I didn't start to think about that. Stop to think about that. Yes, Tony. But you know what I think it is. Under that tape, you saw the real guy. I think when you see him alive, that's yeah. a different. Person. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 the not the. Actor. Brian, did you have something you wanted to say, Brian? Right, say Tony. Tony. Uh, yeah. I mean, what I I listened to the tape and then I said. I, I asked myself the question. I said, well, when did the masks come in? Because I know it was a whole thing with like, oh, we don't know if the masks are really going to work and all. So I looked up when the masks started and I found some article where it listed state by state when they enacted masks, not requirements, but recommendations. DC was the first one, like two months later. DC mm -hmm. was the first. Yeah. So, you know, that's a. That's a pretty long I time think, to get the memo. I think, I think New York was one of the first to go with mandatory masks. Maybe it was not on the list. I just scrolled down because it was in chronological order, and I saw uh, District of Columbia, and I had the earliest date. And I looked at it, and maybe New York was right there. Maybe it was the same day. But I, I looked at it, and I go, man, that's two months. That's a long time. I, I, I'll tell you, I didn't leave the house, I think, until mid-March. I, I didn't leave the house. Mm -hmm. I was too afraid to go out there. I, I felt if you went out there, this would be like alien. You know, you would go out there and this thing would attach itself to your face, you know, and you were, you were a goner. <laughs> what and, about Fauci, though? Like, I always had a high respect for Fauci. I always thought that he was always trying to always trying to correct the disinformation and stuff. But then I look back and Fauci was saying, he's like, I don't, I don't know if we need masks yet. You know, we just don't know well, enough. Well, uh, uh, here's, here's the answer to that one, Brian. And I agree with you. They, the, especially the Republicans love to play the tapes of Fauci saying, oh, well, when, they, when he was asked, is this a danger to America? Fauci said, well, right now I don't think so. You know, uh, 
I, all of that was early thinking before we really knew anything to any appreciable extent. And, and so therefore what he was saying was, I think that based on what I know now, if we just take care of ourselves and watch out for ourselves, that we, we should be okay, uh, that it will be manageable. And he, was, he would have been right because it was manageable, it's just we didn't manage it. You Plus know? there was a shortage of masks, and he was talking to that. You yeah. Know? yeah. But so, uh, you know, but the I mean, workers needed the masks. Yeah. yeah. The nurses and doctors. But if, and us, we needed them. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, the point is, is that that it was. Uh, I think uh, uh, Fauci was. That was early on. You know, that was January. He was making those statements. We yeah. didn't know anything right. about this. And you know what they're finding out now. Do you know when we think the first case of the uh, COVID hit the United States? December. Yeah. So it may not have even come from China. You know, we don't know. The other thing, the other thing we should emphasize here is, yeah, Fauci, like most scientists, gather information and adjust, you know, yeah. their recommendations based on what they learn. But beyond that. It's on tape, February 29th, Trump calling the coronavirus a hoax. A hoax, And yeah. Fauci never, ever suggested that this was a hoax, ever. Right. Uh, yes, uh, yes, John. So, so I, I've been reading now these, I don't know if it's coming from the right-wing radio or the right-wing media, but they're saying, well, shouldn't uh, Woodward had, shouldn't if he had the obligation to let us know, you know, that Trump was saying this shit? And I'm like, well, everybody knew, you know, you know, the danger of the thing. You didn't you didn't need to tell, you know, you, you didn't need. I mean, we needed Trump to be on board with us. But, yeah. you know, I mean, if he would have came out and said that at that time, he wouldn't have a book now, you know, because Trump wouldn't have said anything else to him. Well, so I don't think he, he had an obligation. Yeah. No. First of all, he had to finish the interviews, which took place yeah. over, I don't know, a couple of months. Yeah. Something like that. And then he had to write the book. Uh, no. no, I don't think he had any uh, any reason to necessarily do it, okay, to, to give out the information that he, he, you know, it was up to the president to do it. I, just, yeah. I, I you know, I, that, that's just the president trying to backtrack and trying to make, what he does is he takes somebody who's yeah. writing something and then is presenting it to you and then turning around and making them look like they were wrong in doing it for one reason or another. Yeah. And because of that, that negates any of the validity of what's being said. Who's this shit every time? Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> alleviate him the responsibility not to lie to us. Hey, don't, don't, no. don't talk too loud. The kid's going to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> Did she hear me say that? Huh? This is when she's the best. Huh? This is when she's the best. She's passed out. Is she passed out? <laughs> I gotta put her in her bed. <laughs> Completely <laughs> dead. <laughs> oh wow. Okay, go. Uh, boy, boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we know oh, what he did. He gave her gas. Anyway, um, <laughs> um you know, I mean, I just think that th this is a case where he's trying to he's trying to say, I didn't say that. And you know something? There are actually people that, that believe him. You know? I, I mean, it, th those people, you are not going to be able to change. You're just not going to be able to change them. So don't yeah. even try. But uh, everybody else, I think, is getting pretty fed up with this whole game. And, uh, well. you know, I see a good chance that he's not going to get reelected. <laughs> You know, um. there's a lot of what I call Republican people who just will not think outside the box. No, I know. Well, but. if they were true Republicans, they would dislike this person because he's yeah. really ruining uh, the party. You know, he's really hurting the party more than than you can possibly imagine. That's too sophisticated. Huh? We're asking about for sophisticated decisions. Yeah. yeah. A lot of these people don't like a lot of details. And you ask them about, well, what, what's happening on uh, last night about the news from the new book that uh, was written? And so he goes, I don't know. Nobody cares. Yeah. A lot of people just don't care. 
It's kind of tough well, to do. Well, I mean, you know, if you're going to vote, you want to make an intelligent decision. You don't want to make a stupid decision. Uh, and you shouldn't be aware of what is, you know, even, what are you going to say, Woodward's lying? You know, he's got the tapes for yeah, crying yeah, out loud, yeah. you know? Well, how's he lying? Well, it came out that Trump thought he could talk his way around Woodward, that he could <laughs> finesse him. What amazes talk. me is that he went and talked to him at all. At all, yeah. yeah. All his advisors told him not to. Don't do it. Yeah. I mean, um, or maybe when he did it, he felt that by the time the book came out, the, the COVID would already be on the run, right. and he would look somewhat like a hero or something. Maybe that was his thinking. He didn't expect that it was going to keep going. What are we, 191,000 people dead now? It just came up on MSNBC that a poll said that 54% of Americans will not take a vaccine yeah. before the election, even if it's available. Uh, I, I don't know that I would trust it. I, I would, it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we don't want one that's rushed. We want one that works, but we don't want yeah. one, that, one that rushes. And, uh, uh, you know, we really, uh, we, we don't want that. And I think that most people are afraid that, uh, Although uh, here we got AstraZeneca saying that they were going to they were going to go into the final trials on theirs, but they've run into trouble yep. with somebody coming down with negative uh, results as a, uh, from taking it. So it doesn't look like that one's coming too soon. And that was the most promising one. That was the one out of Oxford, you know. Yeah. So I guess we're just going to have to be able to have the Russian vaccine, right? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody willing to try that one? Uh, no. Here's what I want. I will take the Trump vaccine if he takes it first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Really takes and I want to see him on TV with the doctors there. Boom, right in the arm. Okay, here, I'm taking it. Okay, now it's safe for you to take two. Uh, but I don't think he would do that, you know? And I think we're going to have to wind up being the guinea pigs in this whole damn deal. Which, Somebody will. Huh? Yeah. Somebody's got to taste it, test it. Yeah. Uh, I won't do it at the beginning. I'll wait. Yeah, I won't either. Uh, Trump will just test it on the troops. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, or do what we did uh, with other stuff. Give it to black people. <laughs> yeah. Right? Remember that yeah. whole, uh, all those times they took groups of black people and gave made them the guinea pigs yeah mm -hmm. it's ridiculous anyway we're we're slowly running out of time here and i gotta tell you we had a lot of people uh, listening to us tonight I, I i appreciate that too you know makes makes my heart feel good uh and i thank you all for joining us as well uh let's see brian um with uh you're kind of sideways there we go teddy wampus now you're eating so you're through with your, uh, you're through with your with your shower, right? Mm -hmm. And now it's dinner time. It's nice, you know. It's always nice to have something going on down in the bottom of our screen that has nothing to do with the rest of the show. Anybody, there's no anybody, breeze tonight. Is anybody no here breeze? From New What'd you say, Brian? Is anybody here from New Jersey at all? Me. Yeah. Yeah, right there. Yeah, you're from New Jersey, right, Brian? I have a I have a neighbor who I loved. He was great. He did the same kind of work I did, HVAC. And we would go out there and we'd drink beers and clean our trucks and okay. chew the fat. And today, he got arrested for setting up mirrors and cameras in a, in a local school down here, in a middle school. Hurry and up! So, I'm running out of time here. Yeah, we had news trucks everywhere and everything. It was just so it, it's just so crazy when you know someone who turns out to be like this peeping tom pedophile. Like, <laughs> oh jeez! <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much, Brian, for that story. Thank you to Charlie, and thank you to Robert, and thank you to Jeffrey, and thank you to Brian, the other Brian with an A. <laughs> Uh, Hockey Sockham, thank you, John Larkin. And, of course, Tony, thank you. And Brian Sigmund, thank you very much. Why don't you all give a big wave goodbye. I will wave back at you here like this and say goodbye. Okay, all right. There they go, ladies and gentlemen. That's our citizen panel for tonight. Boy, good show, fun show. A lot of good 
just amiable talk, okay? Uh, next, uh, it's the intersection with Jack Bishop. He'll be taking your calls using Skype, okay? Gabnet Live is the Skype number. I'll see you again tomorrow night. Same time, same station in life. In the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her I love her. And by the way, be careful out there, okay? And wear a mask for your sake and mine. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.